Coming back recently from a mountain getaway myself, I can tell you that there are some odd feelings that come relatively out of nowhere up in the mountains. Sometimes you just feel like you're being watched out of nowhere. Sometimes the woods just go quiet. It's an odd feeling, but at the same time, it's really humbling. Welcome back to the swamp, my friends. It's good to see you made it back for another episode. Today, we're going to be sharing some creepy and allegedly true scary stories from the mountains. As always, if you have a scary story that you would like to share in a future video, whether it's from the mountains or something else, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I'd love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. It's stories like yours that help keep this show going on a daily basis. Now, let's get into these creepy and allegedly true horror stories from the mountains. Hi Swamp, my name is Seth. I have recently moved into Virginia City, Montana about a month ago. I live alone in this two-story house, nothing but mountains, small rock formations, and canyons on my property. It is a lot for one person, I know. This city has a high number of UFO activity. Even I have already seen a few UFOs as I sit on my back porch having a beer. I rarely ever get drunk. As a matter of fact, I have not gotten drunk for about three months. I only somewhat believe in alien life forms, but I have doubts that they have ever visited Earth. I do not really want to get into that debate, but I have a different opinion on that subject. Anyways, on to the story. It was three nights ago, and I was getting ready to go to sleep. I had finished brushing my teeth and went into the kitchen to get a drink from the gallon jug of water in my fridge. Something startled me. I heard this noise from outside the door. As I said, I live in the middle of some mountains, so nobody should be out here. It sounded like a scratch on the wooden door. I stood there for a second, scared of that sound. I had basically frozen solid with my eyes wide open. Whatever was scratching my door did not sound friendly at all. I did not know what to think about it. To be honest, I wanted to leave it and not mess with it. The scratching came from just a couple of feet below my height. I'm 6'3", by the way. The scratching got a little louder, which made it seem overly aggressive. I did not want to take any chances and try to scare it away. So I stood there and waited in hopes that it would just stop and walk away on its own. This thing, or person, really wanted to come in. After about 20 minutes, still standing in the same spot, it finally stopped. I felt that it was no longer there, so finally, I approached my door and opened it slowly. After I realized it was opened, I realized the patio glass door was still closed and locked. The thing is, the scratching sound was bearing against the wooden door, not the patio door. So I thought to myself, what the heck is going on here? There was no way a scratch could happen on the wooden door knowing the other door was closed and locked. Moments later, I see a bright light heading into the sky upwards, not down like a shooting star would do. I was still only just getting over a bit of an illness, but I was completely sober at the time, so I know I was not hallucinating or imagining this. I am never one who happens to be around when strange things happen, let alone anything exciting. What do you guys think this was? Was this a paranormal being that can do whatever it wants without being detected, or am I simply crazy? I do not know if this thing was extraterrestrial, paranormal, or perhaps both. I have only heard about people getting abducted while they were asleep, and yes, I have seen the movie The Fourth Kind, which was based on a true story apparently. Hopefully, I will never experience something like this again. Hopefully, I can get your guys' opinions in the comments. To begin this story, I need you guys to know that after the age of 7 and until I was around 13, I would have two birthday parties every year. Holidays were doubled for me since my parents were divorced and had joint custody. There was this park on a mountain where I had all of my birthdays with my dad's side of the family. 
The park itself had a moderately sized wooden playground and some picnic shelters and a bathroom. The best thing about this place was that it was only partially up the mountain, and there was a trail that went up the rest of the mountain. The trail stopped at the very top, at a little viewing platform that overlooked the road beneath the mountain. My cousins had never been allowed to go that far without someone with us. One day, we got to go up alone. Patrick was the one who suggested we follow the rest of the trail, which led into the woods, up the mountain. We were never allowed to go there, so being the rebellious preteens we were, we decided to go into the woods. The first encounter was easily explained. We just found six mounds of fresh dirt. Already being nervous, we were convinced people had been buried up there. The mounds were all exactly beside each other, the exact same size and shape. Patrick did climb on one of them. Anyway, we continued the trail. It was beginning to thin out when we found a clearing. The clearing was empty until a man walked into it. This is what scared us. This guy was tall, and that was all we could really tell. His outfit is what scared us. He was wearing a black robe with a hood that covered his entire head. We were freaked out, but did not move as the guy standing in the middle of the clearing was almost like statue still. He was facing away from us and staring up into the sky. Eventually, two more people dressed the exact same as him came into the clearing. Patrick wanted to go and say something and even stood up for a second, but something stopped him and made him go pale with his terrified expression. The other two figures stood in the exact same way as the first. It's just my luck that I happen to have terrible allergies and suddenly sneezed. All three of them snapped their heads to face us in a literal synchronization. We booked it the heck out of there. Halfway down the mountain, we decided that the threat of being in trouble would be worse than anything and decided not to tell our adults. We were relatively young, okay? I know, it's a dumb idea. We should have told somebody. But that look on Patrick's face after he stood up has always stuck with me. So I asked him why he looked so scared. What he said terrified me back then and it still makes me a bit nervous now. Patrick told me that the second person that entered had a big knife in his hand, and it had some sort of red stain on it. I don't know what was happening up there. I don't know what we witnessed. But I don't think I ever want to explore that mountain path ever again. I do not remember exactly how old I was at the time, maybe 14 or 15 years old. I had this crazy guy that lived on my street. Everyone called him Crazy Mike. He really was as crazy as you'd imagine, but more on him in a minute. I had this one friend that was a little wild. Let us call him Charlie. He was kind of the adventurous friend that got me to do some crazy stuff. We went through a phase for about two or three months where we would hang out a lot, and it was honestly a lot of fun. One of the things we would do is explore the nearby woods. There was a lot of wildlife, and anyone can go out there and explore as far as they wanted. We lived on a rather tall mountain, and we would hike up the mountain when we had enough time for the day. We would hike back down and normally get back before dark. We normally took the regular roads back down because it was just a little bit easier to get home that way. My friend lived up a few roads from mine, so I would walk to his house with him and then go home by myself. I remember this one day, we had gone hiking through the creek. Bear in mind, it was freezing outside at the time, typical winter mountain. There was snow on the ground and a lot of water was frozen. At one point, we had the bright idea of walking on the ice. As you might imagine, we fell into the water. It was not very deep or anything, not even enough to go above our chest, but we were dripping with water and it was about five degrees outside and there was snow on the ground. But being the crazy kids we were, it just did not stop us. We continued hiking even after we got soaking wet. I do not know if we had just high tolerance to the cold or if it was adrenaline. We were all good though. We continued for a couple of hours that day, but after a certain point, 
I finally talked him into heading home for the day. He agreed, and we went out and got on the road. We made our way back down like usual. But this is the point when I started freezing. I was too cold, and I knew my body was not going to make it back down. I knew that I was in danger, like getting near hypothermia or something. When we got to my friend's house, he was more than willing to let me come in and warm up for a few minutes. But just as we were getting to his house, my mom called me. She was angry with me because I had not answered my phone in probably more than an hour or so. I tried explaining the situation to her, but she just screamed at me repeatedly to come home. So I walked the rest of the way home, and that was that. This is where Crazy Mike comes in, because he lives one road above me, and it saves me about 10 minutes of walking if I cut through a part of his property to get to my house. He had a big fence, but so did his neighbor. There was a small walkway kind of area between the two spots. I was obviously in a rush to get home and warm up. In fact, I was jogging most of the way. I had not heard anything from Crazy Mike by that point, so I figured it would be okay if I cut through his property this one time. I started going through, and that was when he came out of his house with an assault rifle. He pointed it at me and started screaming at me like a maniac. Of course, I turned around and sprinted away. I ran all the way back home and told my mom. She honestly thought I was exaggerating and that I should not be cutting through people's property anyway. That was when I started asking people around the area about him. I heard some stories about Crazy Mike and some of the things that he would do. I heard that he was a conspiracy theorist, a drug dealer, a criminal, a felon, and a bunch of other stuff. If I had to sum it up all in one single phrase, a bad guy. Whoever I asked never had anything good to say about him. And the part that freaked me out was that I still had to pass Crazy Mike's house on my way home every single day. I did not have to cut through his property, but I did still have to walk in front of his house on the road to get to mine. And that made me uncomfortable, because now I was constantly worried that I was going to get shot or something. I still would go hiking with Charlie and all that up and through the mountains. But there was no incident for a while, so I thought that was going to be the end of it. However, I noticed something else. He had video cameras on the outside of his property, looking out onto the road. I had never noticed them before, but now that I was aware of his insanity, I paid a little bit more attention. Whenever I walked by, the cameras would follow me. What freaks me out the most was that they were manually operated cameras. They were not the kind of cameras to just follow motion around. He was sitting there operating those cameras every single time I ever walked by, watching me. I'm not sure if he was recording all the footage or not, but he had made me uncomfortable either way. I remember there was one time when I was walking home from Charlie's house at night. It must have been around 10 or 11. It was rather late, and even then the cameras followed me as I walked by. I thought that was going to be it, that nothing was ever going to happen again between me and Crazy Mike. Well, I was dead wrong. It was still during the same winter season, and I was walking home during a blizzard. I know, that's just the kind of guy I was. My mom was going to order pizza that night and I did not want to miss it. I passed by Crazy Mike's like I always did, and that was when something unexpected happened. He had a giant fence and it had to have been 15 feet tall, and it was thick wood. Part of it was open, and a dog ran after me. I could not tell what kind of dog it was, but it was angry and barking at me loud. It ran after me, and I could tell that it was going to bite me as hard as it could. I got a seriously violent vibe from that dog. I was lucky that I was in really good shape and managed to sprint away. I did not slip or anything else either. That situation could have turned bad fast. Anyway, my family ended up moving a few weeks later for unrelated reasons. My mom got a new job in a different state, so that was the end of my experience with Crazy Mike. And even now, I wonder what his problem was. Was he really a drug dealer or a criminal? Why was he so paranoid about having some kid walk in front of his house or cutting through a piece of his property? I've asked my friends on Facebook a couple of times if they have heard anything about Crazy Mike, and apparently nothing has changed. So, make of that what you will. I guess the moral of the story is, is there are some crazy mountain people out there, so be safe. Sometimes, walking in front of their house is enough to set them off. Rory and I were halfway up Cross Kalur. 
a huge snow chute on the eastern side of Colorado's Mountain of the Holy Cross when the snowstorm rolled in almost a whole day early. That is when we knew we were in some serious trouble. A few days prior, the TV weathercast had told a completely different story. It reported a clear weather window well within our Thanksgiving break, which was one of our only opportunities to tick off Mountain of the Holy Cross from our climbing bucket list. We had already bagged several of Colorado's mountains that winter, and we had been eyeing Holy Cross's steep, snow-filled calure for the previous year. Our plan was to stash some overnight gear at a base camp only a few miles from the start of our climb. From there, we would go for the snow shoot, and then hike out once it was night. We had planned to start the climb in the afternoon when the snow was just about soft enough to provide our boots with grip. We arrived at the base of the snow shoot around noon. About 300 feet up, the snow was way deeper than expected, but the sky was a clear blue. We were on schedule, and the climb did not seem like it was going to be too taxing. Additionally, we knew we would have cell service on the top of the peak. We did not expect to need it, but we were considering it for our safety. We were right about the cell service, but wrong about the two-hour climb. The higher we went, the deeper the snow became. Soon it was loose and powder. All the way to the rock bed beneath, we were moving more slowly than expected but if the weather held, we would still make it up before dark. A few hours into the climb, slogging upward within the steep Kalur walls, we did not even notice that the dark clouds were moving in from the west. The first snows came about halfway through the afternoon. By 5.30 it was pounding down, with the wind drowning out our attempts to communicate. If there were ever a time to quit, that was it but behind us the snow was kicked out and slick from our climbing, way too unstable for any kind of descent. So we went with our only viable option, pushing on toward the summit and descending the much easier north ridge as quickly as we could manage. We tried to focus on keeping calm pushing onward as darkness fell around us. The blizzard rushed through our headlamp beams and pelted our face with ice. When I looked down at Rory, a terrified look in his eyes perfectly matched how I felt. By the time we finally reached the summit, around 7 that evening, we figured the worst was over. We called our parents and told them everything was fine and we were going to commence the hike down. But when we looked around, we saw only sheer drop-offs and total darkness. There was no way for us to find our descent, which is dangerously easy to miss even in daylight. Plus, the wind up top was blowing something fierce making it equally hazardous to approach any steep drops. With no choice but to hunker down, we settled under an overhanging lip of rock below the summit to wait out the storm. We had what we were wearing, goose down jackets, insulated pants, hats, and gloves, plus a little food and water. We prayed that it would be enough for us to survive. But despite our pleas to the Almighty, conditions soon worsened. Strong winds tore through our improvised shelter and our feet grew agonizingly cold. We took off our boots and socks and put our feet into each other's armpits, massaging our toes to keep the feelings in them. I could not get my mind off thinking about how my parents would react to the news that we had died up here that night. This is when the severity of our situation started to really dawn on me. We had been feeling pretty cocky up until this point. By now, I was truly frightened. Temperatures dropped to negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit with the wind chill that night. I stopped shivering, a sign of hypothermia, but Rory and I stayed positive, and I am convinced that was the only thing that got us through that night. I must have drifted off because the next thing I remember was the sun's warmth washing over us. Thankfully, the storm had passed, but the descent was still hard to find. We saw several ridges, and at the bottom of one, we spotted what looked like East Cross Creek which we had walked along two days before. We rappelled toward it, thinking we were home free. But when we reached the creek, we realized that we had accidentally gone down the south ridge, the opposite direction of our trailhead. The one thing we did not want to do, since at that point, we had lost all our cell services. On the summit the night before, we worried about surviving. Now we were annoyed with ourselves, low on food, and tired as hell. Still, we were confident we would find our way out. 
Below the tree line, we managed to pick up a trail that took us to a spot that we thought we recognized as the east side of the mountain. We were not ready to admit that our delirious minds may have been playing tricks on us. We followed faint trails through the forest, turning here and there as the compass dictated, but we always ended up back where we started. We later found out locals called this area the Bermuda Triangle of the Rockies. Iron deposits in the rocks can throw off magnetic instruments, and our compass was taking us in circles. We knew we should have stayed put to wait for rescue, but we could not. With water-soaked boots, it was either move or lose appendages to frostbite. Our optimism was running dry. I would start to feel a frog in my throat, but in those moments you must either crack a joke or cry. So we messed around, talked about girls, sang old Zeppelin songs, and laughed about whatever we could. Any distraction to keep us going. As the sun went down our second unplanned night out, we gathered up tinder and took out our lighters. But, to our absolute horror, they remained waterlogged with snowmelt. Despite our best efforts to dry them, neither of us could get anything, not even a spark out of them. By this point, Rory was too weak to continue so I piled pine branches of snow for us to spoon on top of. We managed to laugh and made a few cuddle jokes, but we were starting to realize that our families did not know if we were alive. That made it tough to keep things light. Soon we both stopped shivering, and neither of us could feel our feet. Matt turned to me. Dude, we could die out here, he said. I'm okay with it because I'm still glad to not be on that couch playing video games, but this is much earlier than I thought it would be. I'm not ready. We laid in silence. Rory fell asleep with his head on his right hand, a position that would cut off circulation just enough to give him frostbite in his thumb. Again, temperatures dropped below freezing, and again we woke up in the morning somehow alive. We had not been hiking long when we saw a helicopter. It was distant, but for us, it took up the whole sky. Numb feet forgotten, we ran into a meadow, and I waved a jacket and a trekking pole with a bright red hat on it. The chopper flew right past us. It circled back four more times before flying off. We felt like we had watched our last chance vanish, and that is when I finally broke down. There was nothing to say. Roy just laid his head on my lap, and we both sobbed. An hour later, the helicopter returned. It had only turned back to refuel, and this time, it came straight to us. We could not stop smiling. It was finally over. I was so elated I tried to hug a rescuer, who just threw me into a jump seat and strapped me in. We were told to look for bodies, he said, as soon as we flew off. I could feel the adrenaline drain out of me. My whole body was in pain. I had been too numb to feel until now, but still I had never felt better. It was honestly one of the lowest and then highest points of my entire life. So I am not entirely sure if this will make it to the show, but this is an experience that happened to my husband and I while we were exploring the Great Smoky Mountains, more so the Blue Ridge Parkway on the North Carolina side. We are both super into missing 411 and like to creep each other out with stories of skimwalkers. Anyway, we are driving along the Blue Ridge Parkway, stopping at the many different overlooks and overall, it was gorgeous. We went back just a week ago, early November, and the weather was perfect. We had seen a few side roads, some named and some unnamed. I'm not 100% sure what possessed us to go off-road. We decided to take one of these unnamed roads. The road was gravelly. There was a bridge or tunnel that we had to go through. It was covered in graffiti, so we thought, oh, okay. People come through here, there's graffiti, so clearly we're not the only people who have been down here, and we continued. We came across these three open gates to three different roads. One to our left, one to our right, and one straight in the middle. The one to the left had a gate that swang outward, as if it were exit, and the other two swung inward, like an entrance. So we chose the middle road, and continued again. We started on down this road and suddenly the gravel turned to dirt and the road went from a decent size to a very slim one-lane road. If you have ever been in the mountains, you know that the roads can be nerve-wracking. Sharp curves, 
one side of the car facing the mountain, and the other side clearly showing you a massive drop off the side of said mountain, imagine all of that on this tiny road. If someone were coming up the road, I would have to back up. There was nowhere to turn. We went down this mountain for a good 20 minutes before we saw, on this dirt road, no bug sounds, no birds, absolutely nothing. There was a small turnoff. I decided to go down it thinking the road connected and took us back up. It probably did, but there was a stream going right over the part where the road was supposed to connect. There was a red truck on the other side of the stream, two guys watching us. They crossed over the stream and went past us, looking at us and nodding. I got a glimpse of one of the guys, and something about him felt off. I cannot explain it, but I got a nervous feeling deep in the pit of my stomach. Now, I do not have an off-road car. I have a Tiguan, a mini SUV. I do not even have four-wheel drive. None of this was a smart idea, I know. I decided I should not go over the stream in case my tires got stuck, and we did not have any cell phone service, so we would not be able to call for help if the car did get stuck. So we decided to turn around. I am a master at three-point turns. This day, however, my husband had a feeling he should get out and help me turn around. I kept having this nervous feeling and did not want him to get out of the car, but he insisted, and so he did. He helped me turn around with ease and got back in the car, and we went back up the little side road, deciding whether to go back up the mountain to where we came in or keep going down. It was then that he told me he saw something in the stream as we drove down it, and that is why he wanted to get out and see what it was. It was a piece of metal, like sheet metal, like part of a broken guardrail, and it was sticking out of the ground like it was intentionally put there. There were no guardrails anywhere near us. There was no reason for there to be a chunk of metal stuck in the ground. We were surrounded by trees and nature, not a single metal structure anywhere near us that could explain why this was there. He said after that he got an uneasy feeling. He didn't tell me any of this until we were back in our cabin, safe and sound. But for some dumb reason, we continued to keep going down this stupid mountain. We continued down the road for a little bit longer, thinking we were going to reach a bottom point and go back up the mountain and come out through the other gate. No, we reached a house. A single white house. Not abandoned, just sitting there, hidden behind a bunch of trees and at the near base of this mountain. I looked at my husband, who looked at me, who looked back at this house and we said, no, we gotta get out of here. We looked at the road ahead of us, and it continued to go down. Like how much further down can you go from the base of this mountain? I have no idea, because when I saw that steep decline, where the road continued to go further and further down, I noped out. I turned the car around and we started driving back up this mountain. I want to mention that the further we drove this road, the quieter and darker it kept getting. It was 3 p.m. on a super sunny day and the forest we were surrounded by on this mountainside was not very dense. I could look up and see blue sky clearly, but around us was this feeling of eerie and darkness. It was not a good feeling. Even as we turned and made our way up the mountain again, my husband was worried about other cars coming down, but I looked at the road and noticed our tire tracks were the only ones on this road. I got this immense feeling of being watched. I kept looking in my rear view, thinking I was going to see someone or something, maybe even that red truck from earlier coming up at us, but there was nothing, and I could not shake the feeling that something was watching us and was not happy that we were around. It was not until we were back at the top of the mountain where the road began we had heard birds again, heard the chirp of insects, and everything lightened back up. The air felt less thick, but our anxiety, that stayed heavy for a couple of days after this. After this happened, we went to our cabin and looked up similar stories. We looked up a map of the area and tried to see if there were any missing people or any weird things that have gone around. Tons of people have gone missing in that area, and we felt so stupid for being so careless. Thankfully, we are safe now, and just thinking about this sends shivers down my spine. Because what if we had kept going? What if I ran over that metal thing and busted my tires? What if the red truck came chasing after us? For anyone interested, or can find more information on what we experienced, we were in between Jenkins Ridge Overlook and Big Witch Gap on the Blue Ridge Parkway.
Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true scary stories from the mountains. Recently being on a mountain trip myself, I can tell you that some of these stories are definitely true. The feelings you get out of nowhere, those sudden quiet moments in the woods, it's really hard to explain. But it is some of the eeriest but most adrenaline-filled moments that you can experience while out there, I'll tell you that. If you enjoyed these stories, please be sure to hit that like button, as it helps me out a ton. The more likes this video gets, the more YouTube promotes it in the algorithm, and that helps the swamp expand its ever-growing waters. If you're new to the swamp and want to join, why not hit that subscribe button and turn on the notifications to never miss a new video, as I upload them almost every single day in all things natural and supernatural. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future video, whether it be from the mountains or something else, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I'd love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp, as stories like yours that truly help keep this show going on a daily basis. If you want to support the swamp outside of hitting that like button and subscribing, maybe check out the merch store. I have all kinds of cool stuff, from face masks, to shirts, to hoodies, and mugs. We also have an exclusive 2020 holiday design that won't be printed anymore after the new year, so definitely check that out and pick one up before it's gone forever. If you guys are on the go and don't have YouTube Premium, but still want to listen to your favorite Swamp Dweller Scary Stories, you can do so by downloading them absolutely free from iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, and just about anywhere else you find your favorite podcast online. Thanks, as always, for supporting the swamp the way you do. I'll see you soon with another creepy video.